right. <clears throat> well, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, to present tonight. I've uh, I've been in the audience a, a a couple of times, and so it's really fun to kind of be here behind behind the podium. So appreciate that. Thanks, Anna Maria. All right. So um, I was asked to present following my uh, detail at the FDA office in, in China. So I thought I would kind of share with you FDA's international engagement uh, regarding food safety and One Health. So of course, here's the obligatory disclaimer that, um, are you leaving now? Oh. <laughs> I'm leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here, here's the obligatory disclaimer. All right. So as everyone in this room, I'm sure you're more than aware, of course, food safety is very important. <clears throat> it's a significant public health issue. CDC has uh, released some statistics that indicate that every year foodborne illnesses cause approximately uh, 48 million illnesses. About one in six uh, Americans become ill with foodborne illness. That results in about 128,000 hospitalizations and uh, roughly 3,000 uh, deaths annually. And uh, these foodborne outbreaks are primarily associated with 31 known pathogens. And of course, there are many other unknown pathogens or unidentified pathogens that contribute to this uh, disease burden every year. Uh, within the United States, uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is one of the two major U.S. agencies that are charged with uh, food safety here. And uh, the Food and Drug Administration, we're charged with enforcing the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which uh, prohibits the distribution within or importation into the country of any food that's considered adulterated or misbranded. And adulterated is just defined as um, that product containing any poisonous or deleterious substance, which may render, render it injurious to health. And of course, the misbranding refers to a labeling that is uh, potentially false or misleading. Of course, the other agency, the other main agency associated with food safety is, is USDA. And there are myriad other agencies associated with food safety here in the U.S., but those are the two main, <clears throat> the two main agencies involved. So... Um, Within FDA, we have a very extensive uh, food safety team that originates with our uh, commissioner at the Office of the Commissioner. Uh, we have seven centers within FDA. Two of them are associated with food safety, and they're CIFSAN, which is the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and their main focus is uh, human food. And then a uh, Center for Veterinary Medicine, uh, which where Eric works, um, and that uh, main focus is on animal feed. Also within FDA, we have a very extensive staff within our Office of Regulatory Affairs um, that consists of our five regional offices, uh, 19 district offices, and we have also five regional laboratories that fall under ORA. And those are the folks that are actually uh, the boots on the ground, if, if you will. They're the ones doing the inspections, both domestically and um, in foreign facilities. Uh, they are also located at our ports and uh, reviewing data for um, imported products coming in and or coordinating the sampling and um, ensuring that imported product is um, meets FDA requirements. So here's a, a, a rough org chart. So we've got our Office of the Commissioner, and um, over <clears throat> in the yellow is the Office of Foods and Veterinary Medicine, and underneath that is the Center for Vet Medicine and SIPSAN. Then we have our other centers listed here, um, and uh, over here uh, with OIP is our International Programs. You'll hear a little bit more about that organization, about that office a little later. And then um, you'll see ORA there, too. So overall, we've got um, over 14,000 employees within FDA. So focusing now on food, um, as I mentioned before, so uh, CIPSAN, the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, uh, their mission is to protect public health by ensuring that the nation's food supply is safe, secure, sanitary, wholesome, and, of course, properly labeled. Uh, but also within CIFSAN, we have regulatory oversight of cosmetics, over cosmetics. And 
So we also ensure that those cosmetics are safe, secure, and properly labeled. So what food exactly is subject to FDA's jurisdiction? Uh, so within our regulations, uh, food, of course, is defined as articles used for food or drink for man or other animals. That, that explains everything. Um, also, chewing gum is listed separately and articles used for components of any such article. Again, lots of legalese. But basically, FDA regulates all foods except meat, poultry, and processing egg products, which are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Agriculture. So basically, 80% of the food that is consumed within the United States falls under FDA regulatory authority. And as far as um, as far as the Department of Agriculture dividing up the 80% versus 20%, there is an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that delineates which product is regulated by which agency. So here's just a schematic to kind of um, show you the, the vast array of uh, commodities that are under FDA uh, regulatory oversight as it pertains to food. So uh, we have uh, game meat, uh, so that would be uh, items such as bison, venison, uh, rabbit, uh, dairy products. We have uh, seafood products, also snails fall into there. Of course, the cosmetics, uh, bottled water beverages, of course, the fruits, fresh fruits and vegetables, canned foods. Of course, labeling is in there. Dietary supplements are also considered food, infant formula, and processed foods, as long as it contains less than 2% uh, beef or poultry. If it contains more than 2%, then that's a, a USDA. A regulated commodity. And then of course all these uh, food items are, can be subject to various uh, problems and or adulterants and they're uh, listed here. So certainly uh, you might be more familiar with the microbiological contamination, of course the listeria, salmonella, E. coli, but we're also concerned very much about any toxins that might be present within the food and that could consist of either staph toxin or um, aflatoxin in uh, tree nuts, for example. Also, uh, shellfish toxin, scombrotoxin, tetrodotoxin, lots of toxins are out there in food products. So pesticides are also a, a problem in um, some products that, that we're concerned about. And FDA, we work very closely with the um, Environmental Protection Agency regarding pesticide regulations. Uh, so EPA establishes tolerances of pesticides within food, and uh, FDA enforces those tolerances, but we work very closely together related to pesticides. Certainly unapproved uh, food additives are a concern. Uh, a quintessential example of that would be uh, melamine, for example, in uh, infant formula and or the melamine that was in uh, pet food uh, years ago. Uh, filth is also a concern public health concern. We tend to see filth um, issues primarily in spices and or dried goods, sometimes also uh, seafood. Uh, we tend to see a lot of filth issues there. Heavy metals, of course, are a concern. Uh, we've had issues with lead in candy, particularly in imported products, <clears throat> excuse me, arsenic in bottled water, other heavy metal issues. Of course, uh, therapeutics, so any kind of drugs that might be or, or any drug residues uh, that could be detected, say, in milk, dairy products, or shell eggs, of course, they're, they're a concern. And any colors, any unapproved or um, uh, unacceptable colors that uh, could lead to having a food be considered adulterated. So with all of those uh, different uh, food items, all the different commodities, all the different potential uh, adulterants and concerns of food. Our um, main focus is to try and prevent uh, foodborne outbreaks, of course, involving those products produced domestically and or imported. So we want to prevent foodborne contamination of any of those commodities with any of those products, uh, any of those adulterants previously mentioned. However, certainly contamination issues occur, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Um, so when contamination does occur, we need to make sure that FDA can intervene at the appropriate uh, points in the supply chain to ensure that product is removed from, uh, from commerce, that uh, it will not make more individuals ill. 
<clears throat> we also need to ensure that we can respond rapidly to minimize uh, the, the harm due to that contaminated product being out in commerce. So we need to make sure that we can recall products quickly, make sure that we can uh, trace it back to maybe the source of and or the origin of the product. And um, so that in and of itself can be very, very challenging at times. Now, regarding our U.S. food supply, so about 85% of uh, what is consumed here in the United States is sourced domestically. We have about uh, over 166,000 registered domestic food facilities that result in over $600 billion in a domestic food produced. Now, we also have about 15% of our food that's consumed that's imported. However, some commodities have a, a larger proportion that's that's imported than than not. For example, uh, seafood. About 85 to 90 percent of the seafood consumed in the United States is imported. As far as our imported facilities, we have over 250,000 uh, registered food facilities that can um, export to the United States, and uh, that generates about 64 billion dollars. And um, also, I have a bullet here that we have about 26 billion pounds of produce imported from 58 countries. So we do have a large degree of certain commodities that are imported from various countries. So it's a very complex uh, food supply that we have here in the U.S. So what are some of the regulatory challenges of those imported products and or living in a globalized world. Well, uh, focusing primarily on food, how this, what are the regulatory challenges for food in a globalized world? Certainly uh, the volume of imports will probably only increase, um, oh, and it has over time, so we certainly have to be on alert for that. Uh, we will certainly have a larger number of foreign facilities that uh, will register with FDA and wish to export product to the to the United States, and certainly that'll probably um, be much more evident with uh, following the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA. We also have increased complexity of products, manufacturing methods, and supply chains. Um, there's lots of commingling of product. Uh, there's uh, lots of product that may be produced domestically, but it's <clears throat> excuse me shipped overseas, uh, for example, pistachios, metric tons of pistachios are produced domestically but shipped to China for shelling. They're then shipped back to the United States um, for packaging and, and sale. So there's a very uh, complex uh, supply chains with a lot of different types of commodities. Certainly another regulatory challenge is um, there's a potential for economic fraud, economically motivated adulteration is certainly a concern um, that we have to deal with. We wish we didn't have to, but certainly um, that's always uh, in, in the back of our minds and, and certainly an issue that everyone may have to deal with. Uh, data information gaps, record keeping is a huge challenge uh, when dealing with foreign firms, uh, we seem to have that as, as a common issue. Uh, records are just not maintained in a complete fashion or in, in thorough a fashion as, um, as we require and or a lot of times we have here in the U.S. And then, of course, we have some migration of manufacturing outside uh, U.S. borders that can also kind of add to regulatory challenges. And then some additional challenges um, in a globalized world, of course, we've got um, different standards. There, there might be some different uh, microbial standards uh, from one country to another. Uh, sometimes there's lack of harmonization of those standards, but there's um, a desire to have harmonization of them. So uh, that can be a little challenging at times. We also have resource issues, a lot of times cultural and or linguistic national differences as well. So lots of challenges when dealing with a product being manufactured outside the U.S. and then um, being imported in, into the U.S. So as far as those products that are manufactured outside the U.S. or produced outside the U.S. and, and wanting to import here to, to the United States, those products under FDA regulatory authority um, 
those products all need to meet and comply with the same laws and regulations as U.S. domestic products. The facilities have to register with FDA and they have to give prior notice. And basically that's it. So FDA is very different from USDA regarding imports. USDA, before a firm wishes to export from a country and import into the U.S., USDA will go to that facility, they will inspect them, they'll essentially approve that facility to then provide product to the United States. FDA, we don't do that. The onus is on the manufacturer to essentially comply with FDA regulations, but they do have to register and they have to give prior notice. And, and that's all that we require, essentially. Um, we do also ensure or um, require that they adhere to food labeling requirements. Um, another criteria that they have to adhere to is if they are manufacturing a processed food, of course, they have to adhere to good manufacturing practices. We also would like them to adhere to good agricultural practices, but that's not, that's not required. Um, well, actually, it is now, but... Um, Prior to a Food Safety Modernization Act, this was merely guidance. It was recommended that they follow good agricultural practices. And of course, there are certainly other uh, criteria that they need to meet. There are some product specific uh, requirements, such as a juice HACCP or seafood HACCP, that the firms need to adhere to. And, but the onus, as I said before, is on the manufacturer. So the manufacturer or the producer needs to ensure that that food product is safe, clean, and wholesome prior to um, importing it or exporting it to, to the U.S. Well, how is it that, uh, that FDA can ensure or at least outreach and communicate to those facilities to have them essentially be familiar with our regulations and or comply with them? Because they are very, uh, they can be onerous at times. Um, of course, everything is written in English, and uh, for a lot of these overseas manufacturers, English isn't their primary language, so there's communication issues, there's translation issues. So we do engage in a lot of bilateral, regional, and multilateral venues and fora to try and build our regulatory capacity, but not only domestically, but of course outside our borders. We also... Um, are very supportive and we're very engaged in those entities that participate in international standards development and harmonization of, of pathogens or minimum residue levels. Uh, we also are actively working to establish confidentiality arrangements or memorandum of understanding with other countries um, or organizations so that we can uh, communicate and or share information readily. Uh, we also, when a firm registers with FDA to export a product, that then allows um, FDA to inspect that facility as well to ensure that, that that firm is in compliance with FDA regulations and doing what, what they say they will do and what they're supposed to do. We also work very, uh, very much to try and enhance our communication and information sharing, work with uh, counterparts, and of course, work to leverage uh, resources too, since that's a, an issue for everybody. So as far as um, focusing on international food safety for FDA, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we do work a lot with um, those international organizations to try and harmonize international standards, and so that's uh, the Codex Elementarius. Uh, work very closely with them and uh, participate in, in their regular meetings and discussions and host meetings um, to try and come to a standard setting agreement. We also are a member, of course, of the World Trade Organization and we work with um, the sanitary and phytosanitary, uh, agree, work under the sanitary phytosanitary agreement and technical barriers to trade agreements. Also, FDA is very engaged in um, a, additional agreements with other countries. Uh, for example, there's um, negotiations ongoing between FDA and um, other agencies and the European Union, uh, the Transatlantic Investment Partnership, or TTIP, um, that will help facilitate trade and, and um, just have a, a level of understanding and agreement that um, products are, are safe to move freely. 
Also, FDA works very closely with uh, the University of Maryland and our Joint Institute of Food Safety and Applied Nutrition to help provide training uh, for these uh, countries outside our borders so that they can become more familiar with using good agricultural practices or good agricultural practices. And we also have done some risk assessment and or risk analysis training. Um, also, international food safety training laboratory. So we work very, very closely with GIPSAN to provide a lot of training that um, is requested on a daily basis. So a lot of our international arrangements and, and agreements are based on memorandum of understanding that we have with various countries or confidentiality commitments or confidentiality agreements, other cooperative agreements that we have and we have established again, to allow uh, the free flow of information. And of course, FDA, we also have a foreign presence. <clears throat> so uh, within the Office of International Programs, FDA has various foreign offices. And the purpose of those foreign offices is to help build capacity, to have a presence in country to help and readily build capacity to help coordinate with our regulatory uh, counterparts in those uh, countries. We also work with regulated industry in those countries, coordinate with the other U.S. government colleagues in country, primarily USDA Foreign Ag Service, um, again, to help facilitate trade and, and address trade issues that we might uh, come across. And also, we our presence there allows for um, ready access to inspect a firm that might be uh, for cause if there's an outbreak associated with, with the product source from that firm or farm, um, and or just to have a, a regular presence and, and routine inspection there at the various firms. So here is, is a map with the, the location of our FDA offices. So we have uh, one in Beijing, China. We have two in India. We have one in uh, New Delhi and Mumbai. We have our Europe office is, is located in Brussels, and uh, we have three in, um, in in the Western Hemisphere. So we've got one in Santiago, Chile, uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, and then our Latin America office in Mexico City. Now, this doesn't mean that the rest of the globe isn't covered. It just means that we don't have an office there. We had an office in Amman, Jordan, and that was closed recently. Um, and we had an office in Pretoria, Africa. We, we don't seem to have that there anymore. But we do, those areas of the globe are covered by our headquarters staff located in Silver Spring, Maryland at uh, the White Oaks. We also have an Asia Pacific office that covers all of um, uh, Japan and, and Asia Pacific. But again, that's all coordinated out of our Silver Spring office. So our international offices, so the purpose of them, uh, as I alluded to a little bit uh, previously, is to engage more proactively and consistently abroad with our counterparts in country so that we can enhance FDA's ability to build uh, safety, quality, and security of FDA-regulated products that are produced outside our borders that are then exported um, and imported into the United States. And it also helps increase our knowledge about imported products um, and it can, we also work to respond to requests for capacity building. So that's a huge component of our FDA offices, just engaging and working with our counterparts in country and to help build capacity building in country. We also share, we also have regular meetings and regular requests from uh, the various countries to provide information about FDA laws and regulations. FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, was huge. Um, lots of requests about it. Again, a lot of uh, foreign companies were just concerned about what those regulations would mean for them. So they were really uh, very interested to hear um, how that would affect them and, and how they could um, change their systems to ensure that they were in compliance with our Food Safety Modernization Act. So they, they were really interested to be proactive and, and try and um, implement things prior to the rules coming out. So capacity building, of course, that, that tends to be, that's a non-regulatory uh, FISMA tool that FDA has available, again, to just kind of help strengthen our efforts to prevent food safety issues 
on a global scale, not just worrying about what's exported or imported into the United States, but really helping to improve that country's capacity for their domestic market as well. So now I just wanted to kind of focus on some of the things um, that I worked on when I was in the FDA office in Beijing, China. Um, I was there August 1st to December 12th of 2014, and uh, I was there as an international program and policy analyst for Foods and Tea. In our FDA office in Beijing, China, uh, we, we have a IPPA, International Program of Policy Analysts. We have one for Foods and Feed. That, that was me. We had one for um, drugs. We also had uh, one person for devices. So all the areas that are regulated by FDA were covered. I just focused on food. And um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. The work was incredibly diverse. Uh, loved living in Beijing. The amazing country, amazing culture. Just had a, a phenomenal time. And the work that is done there in the office is really in incredible by a small amount, small number of staff, but busy every day. Well, the foods people, well, I was busy every day. The device people, not so much, but um, <laughs> foods it was really very, very busy. So a lot of, th a lot of things I did. Um, so for example, I would respond to um, outbreaks. I, I had come from the Coordinated Outbreak Response and Evaluation Group. And while I was there in China, we had uh, two outbreaks associated with product that was uh, sourced from China. So I worked with our group back here in Washington, D.C., or College Park, Maryland, and also worked in-country to help uh, try and find out information about uh, the, the company that was, or the firm, firm that was producing the, the product uh, so that we could address the needs back here. Um, in, in Washington so that we could try and find out what had happened, why the contamination occurred. Uh, we also uh, would kind of scour uh, a public domain and or a public media for any kind of natural disasters or any other kind of event uh, within country that might affect a firm uh, that was producing goods for export to the United States. So this map over here um, that I included so back in uh, August, early August of 2014, when I had first started at the office, uh, there was an earthquake in the uh, south southwestern part of China, and uh, it was a rather, rather large earthquake. And so there was a concern that maybe there was a couple of firms within the impact zone, within the seismic impact zone, that were producing food for export to the United States that were under FDA regulatory authority. And so we wanted to see, do we need to send somebody out there to inspect? You know, Is there any compromise to the electricity or to the water supply that could potentially lead to an adulteration and or contamination event of that product? So I uh, worked with our office uh, here back in, uh, in College Park, our GIS folks, got some intelligence from uh, the people that I worked with uh, native uh, Mandarin speakers and came up with this uh, map. We were able to identify a couple firms within the area, but they were well outside the seismic seismic impact zone. And um, I did that a couple of times while I was there for four months. There were at least two earthquakes, so we, we kind of followed up on, on those events. The current office is now also actively following uh, the explosion at Tianjin uh, that occurred a couple weeks ago. At looking at any firms in that particular impacted area to, again, to see and identify if there are any firms there that are producing food for export to the United States. So it's incredibly helpful to have these folks in country, uh, particularly with uh, Foreign Service nationals that work there in the office. They, they know the language. They, they know the people very, very well. They know the other agencies really well. Um, so we can get a lot of uh, really good, solid information to see if there is truly a potential impact to food that might result in a public health issue. We also had uh, lots of requests for various types of training, uh, low acid canned food training. We did a lot of that. I, I wasn't involved in that. The inspectors, and investigators were. Um, but we also have a lot of uh, senior 
Um, so those the visits always take up a lot of time. Uh, when I was there, uh, our month of November, the country director said it was the busiest that he had seen in the seven years that he was there. We had um, Taylor and his delegation come over to uh, talk about bilateral discussions with Chinese officials. Then following that, we had President Obama's visit. And then following that, we had uh, the commission come over, uh, Peggy Hamburg, to talk and um, try and work on some agreement regarding uh, drug safety. So that was a very, very busy meeting. And so our office is 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 the office to coordinate um, all those visits and work on the logistics and develop briefing papers and, and make sure that the senior officials are very well aware of the issues that they then need to raise with our um, with the high level of in, in the country. We also um, had some additional agreements that that um, were uh, being worked on and considered and lots of drafts being shared back and forth. We also have um, at the FDA office in Beijing, we had a lot of inspectors there, investigators, and so they're going out on a regular basis, um, doing inspections, investigations at various food firms um, or, or drug firms or uh, those device producing firms, lots of inspections in China. Of course, we were also asked to give a lot of presentations about FDA, how we do things, how do you deal with, with HACCP? Um, I was asked to give uh, a food contact materials presentation. I gave a presentation on outbreak data that was very, very well received. And lots of questions about how FDA does it. There was a lot of interest uh, within, within China about how the U.S. does things, uh, how we enforce our regulations, how do we work with the state. So it was really very interesting uh, to, to kind of have to, to share that, to develop a presentation and, and share with Chinese officials, Chinese counterparts, how we do things in, in the U.S. We also had regular engagement, if not daily, then definitely every other day, if not, or weekly, regular engagement with various Chinese officials and Chinese counterparts. So the Chinese FDA met with them regularly. AQSIQ is the uh, group organization that deals with imports and exports, met with them every other day. Uh, CNCA, the um, certification group within China, and um, CF, CFSA, the uh, risk assessment and re risk safety group. Um, they requested a lot of training as well. And as I mentioned here, so FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, was a huge topic of interest. <clears throat> Again, at that time, we had a lot, we had our um, seven rules were still uh, they were not published. They were still under review. They were still preliminary. So there wasn't a lot of information that we really could share with them as far as what the final product would potentially look like because um, they, we just weren't sure. But they were still very interested. So we tried to provide as much information about food safety as we could. So now talking about Food Safety Modernization Act. So FISMA a lot of FISMA is very much focused on import safety. So importers, as, as part of all of the rules that will be issued soon, all seven will be out by May of 2016. So once all the rules are, are published and final, U.S. importers will now be responsible for ensuring that their foreign suppliers have adequate preventive controls in place. So this is the foreign supplier verification program. This, this is going to significantly impact those um, manufacturers and or farms and facilities overseas. FDA, um, as far as uh, a third party a certification rule coming out, we can rely on third parties to certify that foreign food facilities meet U.S. requirements. Um, we can also uh, require mandatory certification for high-risk foods. I mean, certainly a lot of what FDA does related to food safety is risk-based. So there are certain food commodities that are higher risk than others. So we can request a uh, require uh, certification for those high-risk foods. There's also going to be the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, VQIP, um, that will allow expedited review for those firms that wish to partake in this voluntary um, process and oh, yeah, it's a lot. Um, what sixteen thousand? I it, it's I thought it was 
Yeah, oh yeah, huge fee for service. Yeah, I thought it was quite expensive, but it's voluntary. Um, we can also deny entry of product if FDA is um, denied access for inspection. So we're, we're really casting a very wide net as far as ensuring uh, food safety and compliance with our FDA regulations. And as I mentioned before, so a, a huge focus of FISMA is to ensure that food from abroad is as safe as our domestic supply and that the regulations are no different if it's an imported product versus that domestically produced. And now I just wanted to also share the latest and greatest FISMA update with you. Um, so just this morning, our first two of seven rules were published in the Federal Register. So we have been waiting <laughs> for quite a while for this. So yay. So the preventive controls for human food and the preventive controls for animal food were published in the Federal Register. Again, we've got five more rules coming. Um, it's anticipated that we will have three more the end of October. That, so that'll be foreign supplier verification program. That should be coming out um, at the end of October. And then we'll have um, two more. One in, I believe, March of 2016 and then May 2016. But as far as the preventive controls for human food and animal food, so we will um, now, with these two rules, we are modernizing our current good manufacturing practices for human food facilities and establish um, those requirements for the first time for animal food facilities. So this, this will be definitely be, this is a big deal. And we're going to require uh, human and animal food facilities to identify hazards in their food and to implement those controls in the food for consumption of those products within the United States. And I included a link there um, for uh, hot off the press from the Federal Register, our uh, final rules. And that was it. That was all that I had. So I'm happy to take any, any questions um, that anyone might have. No, no, these are, these are final, final, final. No more comments. We took, we, they have been out, they have been available for comment for well over a year. And um, lots of comments were considered and incorporated into, into the final product. So these are final rules. Yeah. In China? Well, the, um, I wouldn't say shocking. I wouldn't say shocking. I, I went on one inspection, and I think we had the inspection. Which is south, like on the coast. And I was, re I was amazed at it. So this was um, a, a investigation, no inspection. And we were there to witness um, breaded butterfly shrimp manufacture. So they, they breaded it there, and then uh, it was individually quick frozen. And that was product that then, went, then that would be exported to the United States. So I was amazed at just the number of people involved in just that that process and just the the single skill that that one person did throughout throughout the entire production of that uh, of that commodity and and I was there with other uh, seafood subject matter experts and they actually commented that that facility I mean they were all gowned up and I mean the PPE was off the charts and so actually the seafood subject matter experts that I was there with, they said, wow, this is a lot nicer than what we see in the U.S. Um, so that was a little surprising. But what I found really amazing was that uh, there was four people around, around a table. And so there was one person that would get the butterfly shrimp and open it up. And th then it would pass it to the next person. And that person would dip it in the egg batter, and then they pass it to another person. That person would put the breadcrumbs on it, and then it would go to another person, and that person would put it on a little tray, and then it would be picked up and um, provided 
in, to, to the freezer. So I was just amazed at just the number of, of people that were involved for, for that commodity. It was just really pretty, pretty impressive to, to see. Um, and, and that was the only that was the only um, inspection that I, that I really went on. So I don't really have any experience with other commodities. And as far as um, I, I mean, they the, the Chinese official China can be challenging to to deal with. They can be um, you know many times they they just were not forthcoming with information. We had to go back to them repeatedly. Maybe ask it a little, ask the same question, but ask it a little differently to try and get the information that, that we needed. So that that was a little challenging, but um, I mean, ultimately, it, it, I don't really think, it, I don't think it was. I mean, I certainly don't think it was intentional. I think it was just you know the nature. Of the yeah. No, these, these are mandatory. So these these are final rules. These these are this is not guidance now. We're we're done with guidance as far as um, preventive controls for human food, preventive controls for animal food. Now, of course, whenever um, new rules are are issued, there is a period of time to allow firms um, and industry to become compliant. So typically. Um, it, it's it's a year depending on the size of the firm. So there we do have um, gradations, if, if you will, of when firms need to be compliant with the final rules. But th this is not guidance. This, these these are mandatory requirements now. Correct. Right. Right. Yes. Yes, it, it certainly has. So um, we we definitely are expanding our staff because we know that the that the workload associated with FISMA, um, just well getting the rules out was quite um, quite a task. But once the rules are published, they will be significant requirements on the agency again to to ensure that you know firms are, are compliant and um, so we are definitely expanding our staff in various areas so our office of compliance is, is hiring quite a bit of course our program offices are, are hiring a lot of individuals at related to to, to FISMA and, and the rollout of, of the rules and to just kind of help support the agency's ability to to follow through on on the rules. Yeah. Sorry, say again, please. So, um, FDA, the facility registered with FDA to export product to the U.S., that then allows FDA to inspect that facility at any time. We can inspect them as part of a regular annual work order process. Maybe more, more regularly or promptly versus a goal product. So if they are, there are issues that occur. If they're not compliant, for example, um, then a product 
will be denied entry into the U.S. Um, or that, that, that kind of a country, um, but more likely the firm could be put on say an import alert, which would not allow the product into the U.S. So the enforcement is through FDA. If you find that on any country, we do have the ability to enforce. That, that product, and so we have the ability to prevent that product from coming to the U.S. Did that answer your question? No, I guess If it doesn't enter the U.S., we don't have any jurisdiction to control it in the firm in China or in any other country. Fine. And again, a lot of it has to do with the space and virus product or controlled product can be hard to get in. We also tend to look at the population that's going to be exposed to that product to see if it's a token form of that firm is going to be inspected more regularly than maybe the other firm that has the same type of product. So there is that. So a lot is, is looked at. And of course, if there's any situation outside the United States, that is that firm gets elevated to a very high level. I mean, yeah. we, we have regular inspectors present, um, and so it, I'm not sure exactly of, of the range. I think some, some commodities it's for two years, some commodities for like three years. So whatever the inspection price is for that commodity, then that is what we will get. And then we're going International firms, we do announce inspections. Whereas domestically, we can go on to the But it's, it's just the arrangement that we have to have a foreign assistant um, coming into China to be informed. We wouldn't give a lot of notice. We would let the, the Chinese officials know that we have a quiet investigation and uh, we were going. And uh, so that was just the arrangement and the agreement that we had to have in that country where we know that that was the case. Yeah. Um, if you
war. But uh, yeah, we did the Mueller Trade Office whenever we would became aware of a, a new regulation and everything. The planet is really going through a lot of change regarding the food safety laws. Coming out with new, new laws like crazy. So we would review them a lot of times when we were aware of them, we would review them and see and, and provide feedback to the sure, you know, maybe you might want to think about this issue. This is an issue, you know, and um, not really sure where that went. So part of the part of it, just kind of uh, the services that we provide. And so when, when we to notify the country that we are proposing new legislation, new regulation. Um, as far as which I'm going to concern, can, I, I just have a lot of experience to really to answer that. Sorry. Yeah, I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm vegetarian. And it was challenging to find, a, you know, good Chinese food that was even here. We did not say a lot of animal protein. We put meat in everything. But um, I, I did have quite a few nice meals at non-Chinese establishments. <laughs> it was uh, a German place not far from my apartment, so I ate there a lot. They have fabulous things so cheese and it's great. The beer is cheap. I mean, it's really cheap. It's one of those places. That be, yeah, it is. It's good. It's good. And uh, and it's one of those places, you know, where the beer is cheaper than soda. So it's great. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Uh -huh. uh, I, I cannot answer that. I don't, I don't know. I don't, Eric, do you? I don't think. I don't think so. No. That feed directive, right? VFD is. Thank you. The agonist. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Alfred. I I can't. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't believe third parties can inspect. I think they can 
quite right. I think they can certify. They can certify that the facilities meet U.S. requirements. I don't believe that's same as inspection. I mean, we we do well domestically. We we, we um, as far as I'm aware, I think we have some some contracts with state officials that states can inspect. But as far as overseas inspections, I well, I, I, as as in he, as here as domestically, I mean, we we don't inspect. Everything. I mean, it's just it's just impossible. Uh, there's just too many firms. There's not enough people to, to do the work. But, you know, so we, we try our best. And and again, by using a science based risk based system that that helps kind of. It, it allows you to not focus your efforts and energy on those commodities that are that are low risk. So you kind of focus on the high risk ones. So so we do that internationally as well. So, um, you know, just, again, looking at the commodity and, and determine, finding out when they were last inspected, have they had a problem since then, um, and then, you know, are there any red flags associated with that firm? Uh, you know, has there been a, a recall? Maybe China provided, maybe there was a recall in China only. You know, do we need to take that into consideration to maybe elevate that particular firm in, in our list? But I, I think the inspectors, I mean, they, they're out there all the time, and, and I think they cover a really, you know, decent of, amount of, of firms uh, that, that need to be inspected. It's, it's what is, it's animal feed, essentially. It's, it's the food, it's the food fed to animals. As far as I'm aware, right? Right, right. It's just, Yes, as far as I'm aware, yeah. Well, yeah. I haven't read the whole thing yet, though. It just came out today. We have to. <laughs> I know. I, I have to. I, I will have to know this because our, our office, International Affairs staff, we're going to be coordinating and uh, really engaging in a lot of the training for um, efforts overseas and getting kind of doing like a, a FISMA roadshow overseas and, and letting firms know how these two rules and then the subsequent rules are applicable to them. So I, I'm not well versed in it right now, but <laughs> that is definitely um, in my portfolio. I know. 